I'm Julie Pace, Washington Bureau Chief for the Associated Press, and this is Ground Game. The coronavirus pandemic ranks among one of the most consequential stories ever covered by the Associated Press in its 170-year history. Here to take you inside the outbreak is AP's Ralph Russo. From the Associated Press, this is Inside the Outbreak. I'm Ralph Russo. Today is Wednesday, April 22nd. Health officials say two people with coronavirus died in California weeks before the first reported U.S. death from the disease on February 29th in Washington state. The finding shows that COVID-19 had been circulating in the U.S. earlier than was previously thought. The death toll in the United States is now more than 45,000. Today on Inside the Outbreak, I'll be joined by AP Supreme Court reporters Jessica Gresco and Mark Sherman. We'll talk about how the highest court in the United States, a body that is typically pretty slow to embrace change in technology, is adapting to do its job while social distancing. The justices will be hearing arguments via conference call with lawyers And that audio is being made public to replace what usually is an open courtroom. We'll hear argument this morning, case 18-13-23, June Medical Services versus Russo. Joining me today uh, are AP reporters Jessica Gresco and Mark Sherman. They cover the Supreme Court of the United States. Thanks very much. and, And let's get right to it. So, Jessica... The coronavirus outbreak has forced the Supreme Court to go about its work in a very different way than usual. Describe how arguments will be heard in this session. This is the first time in the 230-year history of the Supreme Court that the justices are going to hear argument by telephone instead of in a courtroom. So the nine justices and lawyers will join what is essentially a big conference call, and the media is going to broadcast that to the public. Mark, give us a little history lesson on the Supreme Court's, let's say, uh, slow entry to the information highway over the years. I think that's a fair description. The court uh, had its first copier machine in 1979. It stopped using pneumatic tubes to move documents around the building a couple of years after that. And it got rid of uh, hot type machines that were used to set Supreme Court opinions in the 1980s. So the court's never out on the front lines of technology. Jessica, how does this impact the arguments when the judges and lawyers can't see one another, they can't work off visual cues? If you've talked to legal experts, how do you think this will influence this session? Body language is just so key at the Supreme Court, both for the justices and the advocates. So first, the justices ask a lot of questions in an hour-long argument, and often you'll have multiple justices start talking at once, and then one will sort of motion to the other, you know, you, you go first. And so we'll see if the court does anything to sort of make them not trip over each other on the telephone. And second, lawyers really do watch for justices' cues when they're arguing. So a nodding justice means that they can sort of wrap up their answer to whatever question they've been asked, a justice shaking their head or leaning forward or leaning back are all cues to a lawyer. Um, so we'll we'll see how they handle that on the phone. I had one lawyer tell me about his sort of horror at breaking his glasses on the day before the Supreme Court argument in the past, just because he wouldn't, um, he wasn't sure what he would do. You know, would he be able to see them and see those visual cues? Mark, audio of the arguments will now be available to the public. It's not quite unprecedented, but it is a major shift in the way the court usually does business. First of all, why did they decide to go about that and, and make these audio? You know, it's one thing to do the to do these sessions by phone. It's another thing to make the audio available. So what went into that thinking? Well, I think part of the thinking is Supreme Court sessions, when they hear arguments, are public sessions. Uh, there's always an audience, even though it's uh, you know limited to the 500 or so seats in the courtroom. So there had to be a way to make it available to the public. But once you're doing that, once you're providing a audio, let's say, to reporters, There's not much you can do to prevent that from uh, news organizations from turning around and essentially airing the arguments in real time. And that, in fact, is what C-SPAN has promised to do. So I think once the decision was made to go with arguments by telephone, there really was no way to avoid uh, the sort of live access unless they were going to cut off access altogether, which seemed an unlikely outcome. 
And Jessica, how long do you think this audio initiative with SCOTUS is expected to last? Well, they've scheduled these 10 cases. There are no more arguments that they've told us they will hold. It's certainly possible that there will be more. But this is certainly not a permanent change that the Supreme Court is going to be doing arguments by telephone. But the question is, will they provide live audio in the future? And I think the justices are probably don't have an answer to that question themselves yet either. And they're sort of waiting to see how this goes. So along those lines, you, you sort of reference the idea of a permanent change. Uh, often when a little bit of transparency is given, the public will say, no, that's that's the way it should be. We, we, we sort of demand it to remain in place. In speaking with experts and people who are you know, observers of the court, do you think that's possible here? I'll start with Mark and Jessica, if you want to chime in. Well, it, it's a big unknown. I mean, obviously, there are advocates for opening up the court, for making the court more transparent, who say this is a perfect bridge to a permanent change in a new world. I think one thing that's probably in the back of the justices' minds is the uh, the ultimate technological taboo at the Supreme Court, which is cameras in the courtroom. And if you let in audio, are you on that slippery slope to cameras? And the court's given a few reasons over the years why they don't want cameras in the courtroom. They think it might cheapen the uh, level of debate. They fear that lawyers or maybe even some of their colleagues might actually grandstand a little bit. And I think, not to be underestimated, they fear that the late night talk shows could take snippets of those arguments and make fun of the justices. Those are all uh, reasons I've heard given over the years. And Remains to be seen, you know, whether this experiment is successful and if it goes off without a hitch, whether that will change any minds about cameras. And Jessica, I think we we view the court as, well, generally speaking, the justices are all senior citizens. But from reading your story, it doesn't feel like they're particularly uneasy using technology. It seems like all the justices are, have, you know, used iPads and things along those lines. Yeah. And like you said, six of the justices are over the age of 65. But we know a little bit about their own personal technology use. So Justice Elena Kagan has said she's on Twitter. Justice Samuel Alito has described reading briefs on iPad. Justice Sotomayor wears an electronic sensor that she uses to monitor her diabetes. And Justices Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh have children who might be expected to text their dads. Even um, the court's oldest justice, Justice Ginsburg, who is 87, has said she reads email on her iPhone. She did say that uh, she uses a BlackBerry until the court's technology folks sort of took it away and said nobody uses these anymore. There has been, I think, a change over time in the way that justices view technology and use technology. Back in 1993, Justice Kennedy sent a note to a couple of his colleagues marveling at the new device, the brand new technological wonder he had installed in his home. And it was a fax machine. You know, and he invited Justices White and Scalia to come over anytime because this thing worked 24-7, he told them, in a note that I actually found a few years ago in, in the archives at the Library of Congress. So there have been some changes. And the last thing I'll ask of both of you, you know, it doesn't seem like there are the the news is totally overrun, of course, by the coronavirus, but there are going to be some high profile cases here. It doesn't seem like any necessarily have to do with the outbreak, but give us a, a quick preview of some of the most interesting, most high profile cases that will be heard in this coming months. Well, there are the most important important case, I think, in terms of public interest are two cases that involve uh, efforts by President Trump to shield his tax and financial records, which are being sought both by the Manhattan District Attorney as part of a, a criminal investigation and by uh, Congress for uh, various reasons. And so the court's going to weigh whether the president can declare himself immune from these kinds of subpoenas or whether uh, those records will have to be turned over. In addition, there are two cases that involve the Electoral College and whether people who are selected to cast their state's electoral votes in the Electoral College actually have to vote for the winner of the popular vote in, the, in those states. You almost always have party loyalists who are chosen. And yet over his, American history, there have been a handful of times where people have wanted to cast that vote for someone other than the candidate that won the state. So we'll see whether the court requires that those votes be cast in that way or, or allows electors to have a little bit of free will 
and the court wanted to resolve that case in particular before the November election, just in case we have a kind of a split outcome where a vote or two in the Electoral College could make all the difference. Jessica Gresco and Mark Sherman cover the Supreme Court for the Associated Press. Uh, thank you both for joining me today. Thanks for the great insight and please stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. At APNews.com, today's One Good Thing feature is a story about a tutor. Sarah Herlovson posted a message on social media last month offering free tutoring and assistance to any child in the world. Word spread quickly in Canada, where Sarah lives, and other parts of the globe. Since then, she meets daily with children and teenagers via live stream to teach them about everything from ancient mythology to math and biology. Sarah says she was worried about students falling behind in isolation, and her lessons have been greatly appreciated by parents who are trying to juggle careers and childcare. Read that story and all of AP's coronavirus outbreak coverage at apnews.com. That's it for this episode of Ground Game. We'll be here every step of the way during this extraordinary moment in American politics and American life, giving you all the news you need to know. Be sure to tell a friend about us, and please subscribe on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Some of the details of our discussion may have changed by the time you hear this. For up-to-date developments on all of your news, head over to APnews.com. From the Westwood One Podcast Network. 